So a quick coverage of what we mean by data communications and the different classification looking at transmission, uh, data transmission and communication networks and a few examples towards the end. What is data communications? Well, when we're communicating, we're in fact sharing information. So I'm communicating to you, I'm trying to share information to you about this topic. So we're doing it face to face or local communications. Uh, we can do remote sharing information over some distance. And that's often what we talk about when we uh, focus on computer communications. Uh, sharing a, sharing of information between computing devices is what we're going to focus on this in this course. Usually over some large distance, uh, but not always. Um, what is telecommunications? You heard of telecommunications? Tele, T-E-L-E, -E, is what a Greek a Greek word for over, meaning over a large distance, or over some distance. So telecommunications is about communications across some large distance. Same as television is about getting, is vision across some large di distance. Telephone, telephony is sound across some large dis distance. So that's something that you'll hear about telecommunications, communications across some large distance. So when we communicate, we're sharing information. What information? Well, that's the data. Data is the information being shared in the general sense of the word data. What is that data or what is that information? Well, it can be anything that we can think of. Usually text, numbers, images, audio, video are the types of data that we are sharing across computer networks. And so data communications is the exchange of data be between two or more devices via some transmission medium. So two or more devices. In most of the examples that you can think of or that we will use during the lecture, we'll use two devices. From my laptop to the access point, from one device to another. But in general we can communicate, I can send information to more than one other device, to multiple devices. So although we use examples of usually between two devices, in general it can be between multiple devices. So exchange of data between multiple devices via some transmission medium. That's the thing that, that the data passes via. What's the transmission medium between my laptop and the access point on the wall? The devices are my laptop and the access point. What's the transmission medium? Air. Air is what we're sending our signals via. So this is wireless. So this is an example of a transmission medium. Wireless, we send, send signals through the air. Of course, we have wired communications as well. Uh, I don't have a, a good example, but in the back of this computer, I don't know if I can, you can see it. There's a LAN cable. You would have seen these. It plugs into the computer here. It goes into the wall. Inside this cable, in fact, there are multiple wires. They are copper wires. They're just copper. And we send electrical signals across those wires. So the copper is the transmission medium in this case. This is a wired medium as opposed to the wireless medium using my laptop. when we want to cover more, a larger distance, normally we have multiple links, multiple sets of wires to form a network, which we'll see shortly. When we want to share information between two or more devices, we want to do that in some effective manner. We want to do that well. What do we mean by effective data communications? Three main things. We want to have correct delivery of the information, of the data, accurate delivery, and within a reasonable time, timeliness of delivery. So 
We will say our communications is effective if the data is delivered correctly to the correct destination, if the data that is received is the same as the data that was sent, then it's delivered effectively, and if the data is received in some reasonable time from when it was sent. So there are three general measures of effectiveness of data communications. An example of those three, and, and if they are not met, let's say our communications are you, imagine you're trying to communicate with someone you really like. And let's say we don't have effective delivery. Let's say you want to send an email or an SMS to someone you really like and you want to declare your affection for them. So you write this email to this person, you say, I love you, you type in the to address, you send send, and it goes to someone else. In that case, if it's not delivered to the correct destination, we have ineffective communications. The, the purpose of communicating is not successful in that case. So it's clear, I think, if we want to communicate, we need to be able to deliver the data to the right destination, not to someone else. We will look at mechanisms, especially after the midterm, of how do you find paths across a network to some destination. There are different algorithms for doing that. We need addresses in computer networks to do that. So we'll look at different types of addresses. One of them you know of is an email address, steve at sit.tuacth. That identifies a destination. The way that we use addresses is important for delivery. What about accuracy? I, you compose your letter, your email, and it says, I love you. You send it, it goes across the internet, and there's some errors in the internet, and it's received as, I hate you. In that case, what is received is different from what is sent, and again, we have ineffective communications. So you can imagine the problems if we don't have accuracy in the data representation. Accuracy depends upon the type of information as well. In an email, what is received should be an identical copy to what is, what is sent. Okay? If I compose an email, I expect what the other person receives is the same, exact same letters as I typed in. With audio and video, that's not always the case. Let's say you are streaming a, a video from the YouTube web server let's say somewhere in California, to your computer. So this is data communications. The video is on the web server in California. It's being sent across the internet to your computer. With video, and same with audio, it's often the case that even if we lose some data, that is, even if what is received at your computer is slightly different from what was on the server, you can still watch the video. If it's only slightly different, your eyes may not notice those differences. You may see some pixels that are different, a different color. A black pixel on the original video is now shown as a gray pixel for a fraction of a second. You won't notice that. So by accuracy, it depends upon the data. Sometimes we want absolute accuracy, 100%. Some types of data we can tolerate uh, some loss of information. That is, the, what is received is not exactly the same as what was sent, but we can still consider it accurate. Last one, timeliness. You send your love letter and by email and it's delayed for one year. And after one year, the person you're trying to send it to has gone and got married to someone else. So you want your message to be delivered within a reasonable time to the destination. When you send an email to someone, what's reasonable? From when you press send until when they receive that email, what's a reasonable time for you? How long do you think is reasonable? Ten minutes? Okay. Anyone else? Ten minutes? Would we could survive. Sometimes you expect, I don't know, less time, but sometimes emails may be delayed tens of minutes. Normally, they may, in normal cases, may be delivered in terms of seconds. You press send, 
the other person receives it in terms of seconds, but minutes, even hours delay if something goes wrong is possible in email. <coughs> what about using MSN, an instant messaging application, like some chat application? Within seconds. Yeah, no more than five seconds. That is, you type something into MSN chat or a messenger application, it's a instant messaging application. You want the other person to receive the message instantly. Well, instantly usually means a matter of seconds. Different applications have different requirements in terms of timeliness. Web browsing. You visit a website, you type in a URL, URL and press enter. There's some delay before the page is displayed on your screen. If that delay is less than a second, you're happy. If that delay from when you press enter to when the page is displayed is 10 seconds, maybe you're okay with that. If it's one minute, most likely you'll give up and go to a different website. So timeliness depends upon the application. Three measures of effective data communications. We will see them through the course uh, and, and more precise measurements of them. <coughs> to look at how communications work, sometimes we create a model of a communication system. Here's a simple model. In this case, we're communicating between one device and one other device and we can break the parts of the communications into four blocks, this block diagram. We have on the left side, the first two blocks are the source system, and the right side is the destination system, and in the middle we have the transmission system. The first block is the source. This is the device that generates the data. Okay, let's say that, yeah, that is the application on my computer, my computer, it generates the data that needs to be sent across some link or network. So the source generates data to be sent. We have a separate block that sends the data or transmits the data. What it does, it takes the data from the source, whether it's a file, whether it's a recording of voice, and it converts it into some format that it can be sent across our transmission medium or transmission system into signals. So in terms of my laptop, my computer is the source. I want to send something to the access point and out to the internet. Some data is generated. The wireless LAN card built into my laptop has a transmitter on it. And what it does is it takes that data a sequence of bits and it generates some radio signal and it sends that signal to the access point. So we can distinguish between the source, the thing that generates data, and the transmitter, the thing that takes data and sends signals. Transmission system is the thing that carries the signals from source to destination. It may be a single link, it may be an entire network. And we have the opposite at the receiving end. A receiver takes the received signals and converts them back to data and sends that data to the destination which consumes the data, whatever it needs to do with it. So it takes and uses the incoming data. So a very simple view of a communication system. An example, well I think the example of my laptop is probably better than what we have here. That the application on the laptop generates data. Inside the laptop you can find a chip, a wireless LAN chip, the device, that actually has a transmitter on it. And there's an antenna attached and that wireless LAN transmitter takes as an input bits, zeros and ones, the data, and as an output produces some electromagnetic signal, some radio signal which then propagates across the air. It goes to the access point on the wall 
that also has a wireless LAN receiver on it. And that takes a signal that it receives via those antennas. It receives some radio signal, converts that received signal back into bits, zeros and ones. And that's the data that's received by the access point. So that's an example uh, where, in fact, in your laptop or your mobile phone, the wireless LAN device is both, can be both a transmitter and a receiver. If you want to send information, transmit, receive information. So we get a transceiver, a wireless transceiver. To do that, for that to work, although the communications model has just five blocks, very simple, five blocks, the concepts are simple, to make it work effectively, in fact, there are many different tasks involved. So the model makes life look easy, but the reason we have this course for this semester and then subsequent courses is because it's much more complex than that, just that model. There are many different tasks involved in making data communications effective. This is some of the tasks. I will not try and explain them all because we spend the entire course explaining them. Uh, some we may recognise. We need some way to give addresses to devices. We know for correct delivery, we need to know who are we sending to. My laptop needs to have an address. The access point needs to have an address. Because there's another access point out in the corridor. So when my laptop sends something, I need to tell the access point I'm sending to you. I'm not sending to some other access point. I need to indicate the address of the destination. Same when you go to a website, you indicate an address. You type in www.facebook.com. That is the address of the destination web server that you want to access. So we need some way of addressing devices. In terms of the hardware, we need some interface specification, some way to generate signals. My laptop takes data, zeros and ones, generates some signal. How does it do that? That's an entire uh, one or two topics in this course. When I send some data, unfortunately in real life, I may send some data and there may be some errors. Nothing's perfect. So if there are errors, that is I send some data representing the sequence of bits, one zero, my data is one zero one one zero, five bits, but there's some errors and what's received is one zero one zero zero. This is transmitted data, this is received data. There's a bit error here. What we need, if we have such errors, how do we detect them and then preferably correct them? I don't want my emails to have errors when I send them across the internet, but in real life there may be errors in the transmissions. So we have mechanisms to detect and correct errors, to fix that before the user, the human user, knows about it. There's aspects of how do we make our data transmission secure? How do we format the messages in the right uh, structure? Uh, many other aspects of communications that we'll cover in this course and in subsequent courses. The point here is that communications is a very complex task. There are many different things involved. Each of them have complex algorithms and protocols. So we need some other way to break those tasks into manageable problems to solve, which we'll cover next topic. This is a very broad coverage of data communications. The last thing we want to do before we give some more examples is say, we'll distinguish between communications across a link and across a network, where a network is made up of multiple links. So we'll categorise as talking about data communications is how do we transmit our signals across individual links? From my laptop to the access point, how do I get data from across a single link? Or from my PC here, which has a cable going to some switch device downstairs, 
How do we get a signal across that cable that represents data? That's what we talk about as data communications. How do we do it in a reliable manner? If there are errors, fix those errors. An efficient manner. We only have so many resources available, we want to make the best use of those resources. One example of the efficiency is how fast can you send from my laptop to the access point? Anyone have an idea? How fast can I send data from my laptop to the access point? Approximately, or a guess? People are mentioning numbers which are in the order. 54 megabits per second is one number. 54 megabits per second is 54 million bits per second. That's, uh, uh, that's a feature or uh, the wireless LAN standard specifies that's the maximum speed you can send if you have a particular device. Newer devices can go faster, up to 300 megabits per second. What about your mobile phone? Anyone use it for internet access? Yes, some of you would. How fast can you download a file from your mobile phone? Anyone have an idea? Faster than wireless LAN or slower? Slower? Depends upon how much you're paying for your data access for your mobile phone, but in the order of hundreds of kilobits per second for the slow, if you're using GPRS and Edge, or if you're using 3G, TrueMove or whoever, then you're talking about megabits per second. So that's the capacity of our link. We want to make efficient use of that. So if I've got a maximum speed of 54 megabits per second from laptop to access point, when I send data, I want to efficiently use that 54 megabits per second. I don't want to be inefficient and have many overheads. So that's one focus when we look at how do we communicate data across a link? Efficiency and reliability. Of course, we want to communicate with more than just across a single link. We want to be able to communicate across multiple links. And that's where we get a network. Communications across a set of links. We can classify uh, networks as generally wide area networks and local area networks. And another classification may be the internet. Let's briefly talk about them. First data communications. Here's our communications model. Five blocks, source, transmitter, transmission system, receiver, destination. And a little bit more information, given an example of communications across a link. Here, let's say we have an email want to, being, want to be sent from our source system to our destination system. That email is some text, okay, some characters. We can represent each character in that email as a sequence of bits. That is, I type in my message, I love you, and then the computer converts those Characters, I, is converted into a sequence of bits using ASCII encoding as an example. But we can represent the text as binary data. And in most of the uh, data that we talk about in this course and in internet communications, we look at the, uh, the binary data, the zeros and ones. So we have, a, in fact, some text that we want to send we can think of that as some stream of bits of digital data, a stream of zeros and ones. In this case, the transmitter needs to take those zeros and ones and send them as some analog signal across our link. It's my laptop. I want to send this set of zeros and ones to the access point. The transmitter takes the zeros and ones and converts them into some radio signal, which is represented as a, a set of sine waves, usually, and sends those signals across the air. How do we convert those bits into signals? It is an entire topic in this course. Transmission system transmits those signals 
In our case, it's as simple as the air going from the laptop to the access point. The receiver takes that received analog signal and converts it back into bits using the opposite approach as to how the transmitter worked. And we get what we refer to as a we technologies like modems and codecs. You have heard of the words a modem. A modem converts our usually digital data, zeros and ones, into some analog signal. Your ADSL modem at home, if you have internet at home or in your dorm, you may have an ADSL modem. What that does is takes the digital data from your computer and converts it into an analog signal to be sent across the telephone line. Your mobile phone has a modem in it. We will see plenty of examples of how do we do that conversion from bits into signals in our signal encoding topic. What about the bit in the middle? This block, transmission system. Or a transmission line. That's a key part of our system. We have the source, the destination, and the line between them, or the system between them. It's the link between transmitter and receiver. When I say a transmission link, often we'll think about a wire or a cable, but it can be wireless. I have a wireless link from my laptop to the access point. I have a wired link from this computer to a switch up downstairs. So that's the transmission line or transmission link or transmission system. It needs to be able to provide the required capacity that is, it needs to be able to send as much data as we require with acceptable reliability. That is, we cannot tolerate so many, too many errors. We need it to be reliable when we send our bits. And with minimal cost, we don't want to spend a lot of money to buy this link. So there are three important factors. When we choose a transmission link, we care about the capacity and a common way we measure capacity is in bits per second. My wireless link has a capacity of 54 megabits per second. My wired link may have a capacity of 100 megabits per second, or even 1,000 megabits per second. So they have different capacities, depending upon the physical characteristics. When we choose a link, we care about what capacity it has. We care about how reliable it is. You may notice when you, say, watch or stream a video over wireless, it may not be as reliable over, as over a wired link. Wireless is generally less reliable. So when I choose a technology, I care about how reliable it is. And I care about how much money I'm going to spend. So I want to choose the technology which is cheapest, which has sufficient capacity and reliability. We're going to spend several topics looking at examples of technologies that we can choose from. And some of those, or some of the questions that we're going to cover in this course related to the transmission system. How do we convert bits into signals? What transmission media to use, wired or wireless? Copper wires, optical fiber, coaxial cable, wireless, do we use what frequency do we use? Do we transmit to a satellite, to an access point, or different approaches? How much power do we use? How do we encode information into a signal? How do we deal with errors? If things go wrong, how do we fix that? And how do we make sure we efficiently utilize the, information, uh, the communication system? We're going to answer those questions in the next three or four topics. That's about links, mainly up until the mid midterm, in fact. Then the other part is, if we want to communicate across a larger distance, we need a network. Multiple links. One link attached to another link, and so on. Networks. For communication networks, two things that we're going to talk about. We need normally some software 
that allow us to communicate across multiple links. And we'll look at the internet as one example. And we have different network technologies. And we'll classify them as wide area and local area networks. What's a wide area network, a WAN? It's a network that spans a large geographical area. What do we mean by large? Normally, talking about an area covering a city, between cities, between countries, across the globe. So when we talk about a wide area network, that's what we're talking about in terms of the area that they cover. There's a wide area network that links Bangkok to Singapore and Bangkok to Hong Kong. We, SIT, uses a wide area network link to connect this campus to the Rungsit campus. So we think across an area of 10 or 20 kilometers in that case. We would consider that a wide area network. We'll see the opposite, or well, the other case, a local area network is over a smaller area in a moment. Wide area networks, they usually cover a large area, require crossing of public right of ways. What does that mean? If we want to connect, so SIT wants to connect this building to a building at the Rungsit campus. We don't own all the land between. Other people own the land between them. If we want to lay a cable between our two buildings, we need to cross other people's land, including the government's land, roads and so on. That's what we mean here. So if SIT wants to build their own link between the two campuses, it's very complex because we need to get the permission of every person who we're going to dig a hole through. That is, we're going to dig a hole, lay a cable. We need to get permission of everyone who we're going to use their land. In fact, most wide area networks are not operated by individual companies like SIT but, or, or universities, but by companies which have a dedicated business of operating a wide area network. Common carriers or more commonly known as telecommunication companies or internet service providers. TOT or CAT are a telecommunication company. They have built a wide area network which has a link from this campus to Rungsit. So they own that network. And then what they do is they rent it out to other people, like SIT. So SIT pays a telecommunication company to use their wide area network to connect our two campuses. And that telecommunication company, in fact, may rent the network to many different companies, not just to SIT, but to others as well. So the wide area network normally carries data not just of a single customer, a single company, but of many companies or customers. So, for example, TOT has a large network across Thailand. They have cables all across the country connecting all the cities, connecting locations within cities and so on. If you start your own company when you graduate and you have an office here in Bangkok and one in Chiang Mai, in fact, you have several offices in Bangkok, one in Chiang Mai, then you want to connect them. One option is to go to TOT or CAT or some other company and say, I want to connect these three sites, these three offices. Please connect them and you'll pay them so much per month and you'll use their network to carry the, your data across there. Some of the issues that we're going to cover of, uh, that we need to solve is if we have a large network, how do we find a path across that network? We have a large network. There are many ways to send our data from here to Chiang Mai, because there are different links. Choose the best path through the network. And how do we deliver the data across that network? We'll cover that after the midterm. Some technologies that you may or may not have heard of that related to wide area networks, ATM, not giving out money, but asynchronous transfer mode is a wide area network technology, frame relay, SDH, or some other examples. Let's move along because 10 minutes remaining. I want to finish this topic. Local area networks is the other side, covering your home 
a campus, an office, or an office building. Usually owned and operated by the organisation that owns the end user devices. SIT does not own the wide area network between campuses. We pay another company for the wide area network link. But within this campus, SIT owns all the computers, or maybe not the laptops, but effectively controls the, the computers inside the campus. SIT owns the cables. SIT is responsible for the entire local area network inside this campus. That's the more common model. You'll often find that local area networks have, offer a higher data rate or a higher capacity per user than wide area networks. The link from this computer to a switch down on the third floor has a maximum capacity of 1,000 megabits per second just for this computer. The link from this campus to the Rungset campus has a capacity on the order of tens of megabits per second. Much less across the wide area network than across the local area network. Usually LANs have a higher capacity than wide area networks. And there's some implications of that. We're going to spend a topic on LANs uh, several weeks. Some questions we'll ask is how do we share amongst multiple users? How do we arrange the, the nodes? That is, we have a computer in every lecture room and in all the offices. How do we connect them together? How do we arrange them? Ethernet is the name of one technology we use for wired LANs, wireless LAN or Wi-Fi for my laptop. The internet, which is also a network, but a quite important one. What is the internet? It's a collection of different networks, both wide and local area networks, connected together. And connected together in a way that all the devices on those collection of networks use some common software. And the name of that software is the Internet Protocol. We have some protocol called IP, the Internet Protocol. So, we have a LAN inside this campus. This campus connects via a wide area network to the Rungset campus. There's a LAN inside SIT at the Rungset campus. There are many other LANs, local area networks, inside TU at Rungset, in all the different faculties. They're all connected together. Then every other university has the same. And every other company has their own LANs connected via wide area networks. We connect them all together, we get the internet. And the one common thing about all of those networks and devices attached is that they support the internet protocol, IP. Allows any device, no matter what LAN or wide area network they're on, to, to communicate with any other devices, any other device. The internet came from what was called ARPANET in the US. Um, and referred to now as the, well, as the internet. It uses the internet protocol and sometimes you'll hear as TCP IP. TCP is another protocol used combined with the internet protocol. We'll talk about that in the next topic and then later topics, more of the history. What does the internet look like? Here's one simple example. We have LANs, multiple LANs, three LANs in this case, and wide area networks. Here shown just as clouds, but could be multiple devices. And the lines here are links. Let's say they're cables. Some computers connected to some special networking device, a switch, to some other device. Same in this LAN and here. And some wide area networks. Connect them all together and we get an internet. And uh, across the globe, we get what's called the internet. There are some other examples here, but I'm going to show you two more realistic examples. 
one quickly, SIT. A simple view of SIT's network on this campus. We have some labs. So on the ground floor, there's a lab with 40 computers in it. In the other building, we have labs. So those lab PCs are connected to some special device, a switch, by cables. Faculty members have computers in their office. They are connected via cables to some special switch. There are the wireless devices. Your laptops, mobile phones, my laptop, are connected to these access points. And there are multiple access points around. Multiple access points connected wirelessly to notebooks or laptops. Those access points also have cables going to some switch. So we have different components of our network here. We may also have staff, servers like our web server, database server and so on. They form small LANs. Then we connect them together using other devices referred to as routers. Router R here. And that's a simple view of our campus network, our local area network inside this campus. Then there's this special router here on the edge, an edge router or a gateway router. It has links to other networks. So if we expand, <coughs> here's the special router. Here's our local campus network going back. This router has two links. One is of a wireless link, in fact, to the Rungsit campus. So on top of this, the other building, there's an antenna pointing towards the Rungsit campus, and we have a wireless link all the way to the Rungsit campus. That's our, one of our wide area networks. For redundancy, we in fact have, or we used to have, at least another ADSL link, a cable network link to some internet service provider's network. So we'd pay an ISP to connect to their network. Inside the Rungsit network, they have their LAN. It's shown here just as a cloud, but in fact, it could be as detailed as this, and more detailed than this. And then that connects to other LANs on the TU network. And then TU connects to some internet service provider. And then it keeps going, and we get the rest of the internet. So we use clouds here to represent uh, one or more networks, which could be as a, uh, arbitrary complex. So here's a simple example of SIT's internet access. We have a LAN inside the campus, and we have a special router that connects us to the outside world. In our case, via Rungsit and via another internet service provider. Running out of time for our last example. Uh, on this website, and I'll show you next week, uh, or you'll have a look, you'll see some maps of the internet in Thailand. Right? Go to the website, find the internet maps, and have a look at them. We'll discuss them at a later stage. We still have a couple of minutes left. <coughs> 